27 of ECE 5312. And so, in this lecture, what we're going to be looking at is channel equalization. But before we do anything about channel equalization, we should look a little bit about what are the various problems for correlation. Why correlation? Because from correlation, from the continuous time waveforms, we can figure out what the power spectral density is. When we have the power spectral densities, we can then use EWK and the relationship between the input and output of an LTI system in terms of the power spectral densities to understand how they get manipulated. From this, we are going to then look at the discrete time case of this, and then from there explore the first, what is going to be a very interesting set of discoveries with respect to how do we design discrete time equalizers. So, in the continuous time, we have this representation. We have X of T going in, and we have Y of T coming out, and we have an LTI system, H of T. So, let's say X of T and Y of T are wide sense stationary random processes, which you know I absolutely love random processes. So, what happens is we take the input random process, we find out what is this guy's autocorrelation function. We take the Fourier transform of him in order to find the power spectral density. From that, we then take the magnitude squared of the frequency response of the LTI system, multiply it by the power spectral density, give me the output power spectral density, and then take the inverse Fourier transform of that output power spectral density, give me the autocorrelation function of the output. I love this thing. Let, let's doodle this, okay? Hey, doodle. So this is the diagram that everyone should be should remember. So let's say we have x of t. So that's my random process. That's h of t, and it has a frequency response of h of f. And then the output random process is y of t. So let's say we find out the autocorrelation function of this guy. Okay? And we know that this guy has that. We know by Fourier transform that this is going to be equal to SXX of F, and that's going to be SYY of F. And then we know that SYY of F is equal to the magnitude squared of HF SXX of F. Right? Perfect. Now, if we go, like, so all on this slide here, all we see are kind of like the nitty-gritty details for your, for your memory, right? For FYI, for your information of how we got all these things, right? Like, let's say if we have the random process, how do we get the autocorrelation? How do we get the cross-correlation? How do we get the power of X? How do we get the power spectral density of X? How do we get the... Uh, autocorrelation function of x from the power spectral density. So all these beautiful identities, okay? But this is not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is this discrete time case. So now, what is the equivalent of all of this? So whenever we deal with EWA and all this jazz, we usually look at this from the perspective of, oh, okay, we, 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 we have it in continuous time. But in the discrete time, we have Z transforms instead of Fourier transforms. So how would this work, especially if you have a discrete time random process input and discrete time random process output? How, how can we represent it? Well, this, it's almost there's a mirror image, except that instead of T plus tau, you have K, which is your time index. Uh, sorry, N is your time index, and you have K, which is your offset. It's almost identical, right? So let's say you have the random process x of n to get its autocorrelation function in the, in the discrete time is equal to the expectation of x k plus n times x of n. And this is also equal, there's a symmetry, is equal to minus k, right? And then you have the cross-correlation. To get the power spectral density from the autocorrelation in the discrete time, you take the z transform. Now here's something that people don't like, okay? Especially at like 8.30 at night, the last thing people want to see is a contour integral. Oh yes, like I just see the like 
expression of, oh, this is going to keep me awake at night tonight. What happens is, in order to get the inverse Z transform, so there's the quick and dirty way, which is, if you know what the Z transform pairs are, or if it's fractional and you can do partial fraction expansion and all that, there are quick and dirty ways. If you want to do it in a brute force way, to get the inverse Z transform, you have to do a contour integral, which means, oh, here's another word that people don't like hearing. You have to do residue calculus. <gasps> How many people here did residue calculus? Uh, only one. Rishab is, okay, so two, that's it? No one else did? Okay, and, and you know. Um, what happens is, here's another question. How many people here took partial differential equations? Three. Okay. And maybe, okay. Because that's the thing, like, you know, I, I would think that electrical engineers should do more of that anyway. Anyways, contour integral, if you want to do the theoretical way of solving the inverse Z transform. And so what we're going to do is, um, after, uh, we're going to look at these properties. So this is the discrete time equivalent of that relationship I just showed for relating the autocorrelation function to the power spectral densities, what happens is instead of the magnitude squared of the frequency response multiplied by the input power spectral density, instead it's h of z, so that's the transfer function in z transform domain of your um, LTI system, times h1 over z, which is equivalent to h complex conjugate 1 over z complex conjugate. So not as pretty, right? And then if you want the cross spectral density, then you only multiply against the 1. So before we go any further with that contour integral, what's so powerful about the z transform? What happens is, as long as you know the I.O. properties of your system, so you know what the input are, and you know what your system have. Like, you know, does the output example we have here. So what we have is we have an input x of k, so time instant, discrete time instance k, and that is added to a delayed version. So we have a unit delay z to the minus 1 of y of k, so that's going to be y of k minus 1, multiplied by a, fed into x of k, and that produces y of k. So what we got is y of k is equal to x of k plus a y k minus 1. So now what happens is if we have that, what's the z transform of all of that? So that would be like, you know, some sort of, well, actually, well, yeah, it's, it's down below. So let's say, hmm. if we go down, what we do is we use a differential model. So we have the z transform of y of k. We have the, uh, the z transform of y k minus 1. What is this guy equal to? z to the minus 1 y of k, or z transform of y of k. And then you have the z transform of x of k. So what you end up getting is you gr group up all the y, z's together. And so you're going to have this guy here. And you're going to have x on the other uh, side. And your h of z is going to be equal to your y of z divided by your x of z. That's going to give you your transfer function, which is this. And it turns out this is a standard form that in the time domain, the inverse z transform gives you that, right? So you can look at any sort of uh, signals and systems textbook to give you that expression. Now, there's a few other things. So what happens is you have an autocorrelation function that's equal to a delta. You know that it's uncorrelated samples. And then the power spectral density, okay? If you take the sum of all those autocorrelation terms, z to the minus k, what happens is, and it's equal to a constant, that's the power spectral density of white noise sequence. So here's the thing. Suppose that you use a filter from the previous example and you add white noise to the input. What you get, okay, and this is where nightmares are formed, 
if you've taken residue calculus before. So what happens is, suppose this is the expression. Like SY is equal to, instead of the magnitude squared of the frequency response, what you have is the frequency response, and then you have the frequency response 1 over Z, right? And S of, S of X of Z. And we know that it's a white noise input, which means it's a constant, just like in the continuous time domain. But here, Z and 1 over Z, we get this guy here, and we have QZ over Z minus A, 1 minus AZ. Okay, what is the autocorrelation function of this? So the brute force approach to this is to do con Yeah. At 1140, at, I mean 840 at night, let's do contour integrals. No. But... So the noise, uh, what we're doing is we're, filter, we're, we're filtering in, the, we're, we're basically, we have this system. So the question is, where's the noise? And the answer is, the noise is the actual input. We're not putting any signals in. So how will the noise get shaped in the discrete time domain? Good question. Good question. And so the thing is, we have the resulting expression. If we use the contour integral, the way this would work is, you would declare this entire expression here, as f of z, it's a function of z, and you have this 1 over 2 pi j, that's part of the contour integral. So what we want to do is use residue calculus. So residue is, you have like your contour integral, and what you've got to do is you've, you have these, uh, the, these poles located in this plane that you're integrating along that circle, right? So the first thing you would do is you would find where all these residues of FZ exist in this plane, right? Uh, where the, these poles are. So we know, okay, so look at the denominator. Where does this thing blow up? It blows up at Z equals A, and it blows up at Z equals 1 over A. Those are where our poles are. Okay? So the, for the Z equals A pole, the residue at A is equal to the limit of z goes to a, z minus a, f of z. And so if you calculate that limit, okay, um, what ends up happening is, so let's say we know that f of z is equal to that expression. What you do is, first of all, you have to take, you know, for k greater than or equal to 0, in order to get that uh, rx of k, and for k, um, because what happens is we know that there's a symmetry thing going on when we have uh, Rx of k and Rx minus k, right? So what we need to do is we actually need to break this up and look at the case for when k is positive or equal to 0. And so for, for this expression for f of z. So here's our pole at a. Here's my contour integral. Let's say it's of unit radius. So we, go, we integrate along this contour. And so if we take the limit as a goes to, um, as z goes to a, what do we have? First of all, this expression now, we get q z to the power of k. Remember that k here has to be positive. Divided by 1 minus a z, and we let z limit a. And so what we get is this expression here. That's our residue. A, okay. c not so bad. It's easy. Now, so this actually gives us, um, you know, our y. This is our inverse, right? The, through residue calculus, this gives us our um, inverse z transform, which is equal to r y of k. This is the output autocorrelation function, right? When k is positive. So that's a condition, all right? And so we have, if you actually plot this, what does your autocorrelation function look like? It looks like this thing here. But um, what happens is, you know, let's say we want to find out what is the cross-correlation cor cross at the output, be between the output and the input. You would use almost the same approach, residue calculus, and then do the same approach. But here what happens is, again, you would say what is for a positive k, and then you have a within inside the unit circle, or that circle c, and you would see, oh, it's only equal to Q, A, K. And then what happens is we also have these other things, the negative values of K, which we did not consider previously. So let's say if we do that, 
Um, it kind of gets messy, but first of all, it, the, the reason is partly um, what happens when we have a cross-correlation? Do we have the same sort of symmetry? Not, not quite, no. So what, what ends up happening is we have this SXY of Z is equal to H1 over Z, S of X of Z, and we have this term. And again, if we do that residue calculus thing, we have this thing, and we let, in this case, K is greater than or equal to 1. Again, we need to have a positive exponent. What happens is there are no poles inside C. Okay? And so what happens is we do, we do have a pole at Z equals 1 over A. Okay? Uh, when A is, uh, the magnitude of A is less than 1. And so what happens is that residue is actually equal to 0. So what happens is, are there any poles? No residue. It's zero. Right? We integrate nothing. The only way residue calculus works is whenever we have a pole continuity inside the, the, the contour integral that we're trying to integrate, we find out all the residues and we add them all together. If we have no discontinuities inside that region, there are no residues integrated, it's zero. Okay? But it's very dependent on what k is equal to. Right? Is k positive? Is k negative? Right? And so what happens is, suppose we look at the k is negative situation. What we end up getting is, obviously, we have a discontinuity, right? And it's actually a, but it's only going to be, it will be decreasing as a function of k. So we have, in, uh, you know, for, for, for some values of k, that's because we won't have the discontinuity because there are no poles there when k is less than minus 1, we have no residues, but if uh, minus k is greater than or equal to 1, we actually have a discontinuity, we have a pole inside that circle, and therefore that's why we have this sort of half solution. Ah, okay. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to wrap things up with a little bit of linear equalization. So, I think, I've, I think I've said this way too many times, and I think everyone's like, oh my god, not again. Transmitter, channel, receiver. Okay? That's what my life is all about. Transmitter, channel, receiver. And what we saw is we have your impulse mo modulation and source produces INs, um, or a train of them, right? You pass them through your transmit filter, you pass them through the channel filter, you add noise, it passes through the receive filter, which is matched to the combination of your transmit and channel filter combined, and then you sample every t seconds to give you your answer, right? Now, what happens is you, the overall response before the receiver is h of t convolved with h of c. And what we want is the design, in this case, logically, we want something SNR maximizing. It would be preferable if we had something that's zero ISI, but we probably won't. So we, what we would like to do is to match H of R with the combination of H of T and H of C, right? So this is what this guy is. The optimal approach is we have a match filter. So if we do the match filter, we have this expression, and that looks like, what do we have here? Like, it, it's exactly that. So we have the complex conjugate of the flip version of the combination of your transmit filter and your channel filter convolved with the combination of your channel filter and uh, trans uh, a channel filter. So what ends up happening at the end of the day, if you look at this guy, is if you go through all of this and then you throw in that z of t into this, what is the output y of t going to consist of? So if you design this properly, if you're matching the receive filter to the combination of the transmit and channel filters, you should have no ISI or very little of it, but you're going to have non-white noise. And this is going to be the bane of our existence in this, the end of this lecture and the next one. Okay? So what we're going to do is when we have this Y of T, so let's look at Y of T. What's the problem with it? So we have this guy. So this G of T minus N is sort of the composite response of HR with HC and HT. 
and we have Z convolved with the received filter, and that's going to be our problem. Okay? So what happens is we know what HR is going to be equal to. We know what G. G, ideally, we're going to try and target some response. In this case, it's going to be phi H of T. This is what I don't like. This guy. This is going to be shaped noise. This is going to be shaped noise. And so let's say we sample. We go, so everything is based off of this model. If we sample now, so what happens is we looked at what y of t is. And then we sample it, so now we have a discrete signal situation. So that's why I went through all the rigmarole at the beginning. Here's a continuous time. Um, autocorrelation, cross-correlation, power spectral density expressions. Now here's the discrete time version of the same thing. This is where I'm coming from. What happens is it comes down to this guy here. This is still continuous time. Oh, this guy here, he's still continuous time. Oh, now we start sampling. So we have this x k minus n times I n, that's our information symbol, and then we have this x k minus n thing, and that x k minus n, that's, that's basically the outcome of convolving the h of c, h of t, and the h of r all together, given that the target h of r is actually equal to the And this xk minus n might not still be so good either. Okay? So we have match the, you know, the two frequency responses convolved with each other. So it's some sort of channel autocorrelation function. So we take the h of t and h of c, convolve them together to make h, and then we take the other. Right? X of t is actually the correlation. V of k is our noise. Now, what happens is this is not white noise. This won't give us a delta. So what we need to do is we need to figure out what does this give us. And it turns out that, let's say Z of t is Gaussian and white. If we go through this math, so we know that z star of s times z of t, okay, so this is continuous time um, correlation function. This should give us n naught delta t minus s, right? But how about this guy here, this v of k and v of l conjugate, expectation of it? Well, if we expand this out, right, to, to, to basically be this function here. So if we plug in z, uh, uh, v of k, and v of l star. So we plug this in. So if we do that, so let's say we take this guy here, and then we take v l star. So what would that be? It would be replace all the k's here with l's and make a complex conjugate. And then you do v of k, v of l star, expected value of that. So combine those two integrals together. You're going to get a little bit of a mess. But what's going to be is when you work it out, what you end up getting is n naught xk minus l. And it turns out that this guy here, right? So let's say we make l some sort of multiple or some sort of like, you know, we have a common term n and one shifted version of the other, like this one here, which will give us the autocorrelation of v it gives us this kind of very interesting sort of envelope shape, both negative and positive, of these alternating deltas all the way from minus infinity to infinity, right? So we have this very nice response. And so what's the power spectral density of that looking like? It's going to be n naught in the power spectral density, or sorry, not the power spectral density, the z transform of x of z. And so if you try and whiten, what is the process of whitening? What we want to do is from v of k, 
what do we need to do in order to make that autocorrect? So basically, what sort of filter do we need? So if we feed V of K into it, the output, the autocorrelation function is a delta. So that's the goal. So how do we do that? So suppose we How did you get the inverse response? Like, so, so how, how do we get the output? We have h of z times h star 1 over z star times the input power spectral density to get the output power spectral density. What did I do here? What I did is, so what's this guy? Let's say that's my h of z. What's my h star 1 over z star? It's going to be plug in all of that. And what you're going to get is this guy here, right? And this times that, we call it x of z, right? It's 1 over x of z. And what is the power spectral density of the input? And not x of z. So what we're trying to do, the goal is we know what that x of z guy looks like. So if we can choose a filter which has this characteristic where if we find the power spectral density of the input is n naught x of z and the frequency response when we take the magnitude squared or whatever the equivalent is in the z transform domain gives us 1 over x of z they cancel out and we get n naught the constant and that's white that's the goal right but the problem is finding f of z that is not easy okay but we're going to look at it in the next class. So that's how we get to this. And so what we're going to see is that in the next class, we're going to see a little bit more about how this whitening works, all right, in order to, because without that whitening, our things get a little bit complicated at the receiver when we try and decode and such. So with that, that concludes lecture um, 27. And you, th you thought, I would not finish lecture 27 in time. Well, I'm five minutes late.